thanks so much for uh, inviting our paper to be on the program. It is wonderful, as Eric pointed out, to be back in person and being able to talk. I've always feel that a benefit of coming, especially to these smaller conferences, is having a lot of like-minded people with whom to share ideas and just fun discussions as well. So this is joint work with Wei Zhang uh, at Princeton, CUHK Shenzhen, currently visiting uh, Cambridge for the year. So what's the motivation for this paper? So this is a relatively new, but also not so relatively new paper for us. So we've been thinking a lot about these issues. And the motivation is there are two important trends within the booming digital economy. One is the growing popularity, and I'll admit this person, of uh, cryptocurrencies and tokens. As of May 2020, there was about 4136 cryptocurrencies, not including those that failed, that's even more. And I'm sure Donghua could tell you more about what the actual number is right now. It just keeps proliferating. Um, it's attracted a lot of interest. Uh, it's trying to get more mainstream and it's trying to, um, a lot of practitioners and industry um, specialists are trying to get more adoption widespread across um, the general uh, economic community. The second is a growing tension between digital platforms and their users. So there's often concerns about exploitations of users' data privacy. A lot of articles have come out in the past few years, for instance, with Meta, about how users' data is being processed and being put into algorithms can be often done in ways that we don't fully know and also may be in ways that may not be in the user's best interest. For instance, consider the case of Instagram uh, with the study they did with um, young girls and how it affects their body image. There's also concerns of antitrust uh, within big tech, a lot of monopoly power, concentration of power into relatively few platforms that becomes a very daunting proposition to opt out of um, if you were to try to escape from it. And then there's data privacy regulations in the EU, US, South Africa, and Japan, a lot of them based on GDPR, such as in the EU and South America, but there's also like CCPA in the US. And these seem to be sort of an early response to what's going on on these large digital platforms. So we're gonna to argue today is that tokenization may be a way of trying to resolve this conflict between platforms and their users. And the idea behind it is crypto technology makes it possible to delegate control of a platform to a set of pre-coded algorithms, such as through smart contracts. And this kind of just gets at the idea of the excitement behind Bitcoin about why it came back in the first place. If you go back to Satoshi's white paper, he would say that the creation of these platforms is to try to get us away from central banks that can potentially inflate away the currency and away from intermediaries who might be creating uh, issues of censorship or charging a lot of fees to complete transactions. So this idea of disintermediating, moving away from a central owner might be able to create value um, when done through tokenization. And it may also be a way to decentralize the future of finance. Camp has a lot of work on this. It's a very exciting space. It's brought us all together today. So how are we gonna think about tokenization? Well, tokenization, at least historically, has occurred through these initial coin offerings or ICOs. Platform developer gets paid by issuing coins and tokens rather than traditional equity shares. Although the use of ICOs has kind of declined a bit compared to its peak around 2017, 18, it still represents a viable form that may be used going forward. What we're gonna talk about is how tokenization facilitates decentralization through what are called Decentralized Autonomous Organizations, or DAOs. And some examples I have here, Aragon, Decred, Kyber, Maker, DAO, Shapeshift, and Tezos. Some of them are on their way to full decentralization. Some are already there. And I'll use, uh, come back to uh, this and one other as an example to try to, to give you an idea of what these platforms look like. So an important feature is that governance on these platforms is through users or the user community through sophisticated voting mechanisms. Some of them are through staking, you know, you put a certain amount of coins into a stake or tokens into a stake and you're given a vote either through a lottery system or based on your, on your holdings or you have governance tokens. Those governance tokens can also be used for voting on protocols to try to improve the overall platform community. The most popular type of token, at least as of now, are utility tokens. So that's gonna be kind of our key example. I'm gonna to try to generalize some of what I say to more general token schemes toward the end of the talk. So an important uh, feature of utility tokens is you accrue a convenience yield. There's some benefit you get from using it on the platform. It could be for peer-to-peer -peer transactions, could be with file storage, such as with Filecoin or gaming with Gamercoin. Um, so there's some sort of fundamental convenience yield that users are able to extract from it, from holding and using these tokens. 
There is also retrade value, and this leads to a speculative motive. I'm going to kind of shut that down for today to just think more about the, the uh, fundamental value of these platforms. But I'll say something again, a little bit about retradeability toward the end. So what can you do on these platforms? Well, you can write uh, smart contracts, storage, gaming, gambling, you name it, there's, there's a platform for it, I would say. So why do we think decentralization is an important issue in this community? Well, I'm going to take a quote from a CEO of Shapeshift, and I'll, I'll kind of read parts of the quote. Unorthodox, but it's the only way to maintain fidelity to the most important principles of crypto, specifically self-sovereignty over money. Again, this excitement about moving away from central intermediaries like central banks. And for the second part, for DAOs, the organizational format that succeeded the, during the industrial age may not be the optimal format for the digital age. There's a new kind of firm, the decentralized autonomous organization. And we're going to think about why is this new type of firm may be optimal and also how it may, where we expect to see it in terms of what types of platforms might decentralize. So I'm going to go through two examples just to talk about what they do, but also importantly, the governance. So Filecoin ICO'd in 2017 raised about 257 million. It matches buyers who have a demand for storage. For instance, your Bitcoin key. You know, if you, anyone has it, they can get in, take your Bitcoin, and that's how you would get into your uh, wallet. You can separate it into, for instance, three different pieces. You have a demand for storage. There are a bunch of people who have computers uh, that have space on their hard drives that they're not using. Those are the sellers of storage. You have a locator who's going to disassemble your file, split it over those suppliers who are going to bid for this um, storage space. And then later, the lo locator will also reassemble the file if you want to pull it out. Um, and make use of it again. And there are, of course, miners in the background who are going to record the addresses of all these scattered file pieces on the blockchain. So how is this decentralized? Well, the way that new ideas are implemented is a community is going to propose, discuss, and achieve consensus on what are called Filecoin improvement protocols. And this is through vote. And the idea is hopefully because users are voting, they're always going to vote in their collective best interest. So that's Filecoin. The other example I'm going to use is Tezos. And we have more in the paper if you're kind of interested that we discuss. Um, but for sake of time, I'll just focus on these two. So Tezos ICO'd in 2017, raised 232 million, launched later in 2018, facilitates peer-to-peer -peer transactions as well as uh, smart contracts. The governance is among users who vote in two stages on updates proposed by developers. And developers whose ideas are implemented are paid in newly minted Tezos coins. So again, the key takeaway between Filecoin and Tezos here is that the governance is among users, often through sophisticated voting schemes, um, that they're gonna try to figure out how to improve the platform through collective wisdom, um, hopefully in the best interest of users. So the conceptual questions we have in mind for today, what are the pros and cons of tokenized platforms relative to something that's conventional equity-based platform? Kind of the firm up until now that we think of as being like the legacy of the industrial age. Is decentralization desirable for all digital platforms? Should we see it everywhere or in specific places? We're gonna to try to provide predictions on that. How do outside investors and consensus validators impact decentralization? These will be some auxiliary questions I come to after showing the main model. And the casual observation is these two groups are important to cryptocurrency platforms. A lot of papers are written on consensus validators, whether it's proof of work, proof of stake, proof of burn, delegated proof of stake. A lot goes into thinking about how to manage the blockchain. And also with outside investors, we see there's a lot of excitement about participation of institutional investors getting into the space and treating this as another asset class. Is this a good or a bad idea? when the goal is decentralization. So what are the key insights? So I'll give you the key takeaways and then we'll just go through the math and some further discussions. What we're gonna argue is in the presence of network effects and a lot of these platforms rely heavily on network effects. I think that's really what defines that one of the key defining achievements of utility token platforms is they have a specialized use and they bring together across the world communities of people who have a similar interest. For instance, for gambling, brings gamblers across the world together onto, uh, gamer, onto Dragoncoin. So there's gonna be a tension between these network effects, getting all these people on the platform for which we think they're at least somewhat increasing returns to scale and decentralization. And why is that? Well, users face costs to join these platforms. You know, you have to set up your account, you have to download the software, you have to figure out how this 
uh, network or how this platform works. So subsidizing marginal users is, sub is desirable to maximize the network effect, especially for marginal users who don't get as much benefit as others. And we see this on centralized platforms like Google, Facebook, or now Meta. They provide free services to attract users. You get free email, free search, you get free messaging, such as through WhatsApp. So they provide a lot of conveniences to kind of get people onto the platform. And once you have a lot of people, you get a lot, unlock a lot of value through those network effects. A conventional platform has an owner who has an equity stake. They receive some sort of dividend or, or payment from, from managing the platform. They have an incentive to, to maximize this network effect, to provide a subsidy. And we're gonna kind of see that come out a bit more when we get into the model. The issue though, is that the owner cannot pre-commit not to exploit users when profit is low. We're gonna have some sort of subversive action that if profits are anticipated to be low in the second period of our model, the owner can take some sort of action to exploit the user's data and by exploiting data, for instance, selling it to third party companies, using addictive ads, what have you, it can try to make back some of its lost profits. But the issue that what we're going to show is by making by decentralizing, it makes it possible for a tokenized platform to pre-commit, but at the cost of this um, subsidizing the network effect. So by, by um, delegating the control of the platform to these sort of pre-coded algorithms and letting users vote on actions um, on the platform, you're going to get rid of this issue of, of exploitation. But at the same time, as each user is small, only has is not an owner of the platform, they're not going to have that incentive to subsidize participation. So you're going to be sacrificing some of the network effect to prevent this sort of exploitation. And what we're going to show is that this sort of scheme is appealing when the expected platform fundamental is relatively weak. That's not to say it's a bad platform. It's just, it's a speculative platform. At the moment, it's, we don't think it's gonna be an Amazon. If it's an Amazon, you'd love to be the owner of Amazon. But if it's a platform with a new technology, you're not necessarily sure how it's going to go. And you're worried there's a chance you might have to exploit or you won't be able to uh, stop exploit from exploiting uh, users in the future. You might want to decentralize. So that's like the key insight. Decentralization has a tension between um, committing not to exploit users and maximizing the network effect. So then in two extensions, we're gonna ask what happens when outsiders participate. So suppose first that we generalize from utility tokens. You might say utility tokens don't are pretty inefficient. There are ways of unlocking more value. You could have them pay dividends, for instance, similar to equity. So like a mix of an equity and utility token, we'll call that an equity token. That's great. We're going to show actually that helps to achieve nearly the first best. But the issue is when you have an outside speculator, that speculator is going to start buying those tokens just to get the dividends, just to get the return from those tokens. And if they acquire enough of a controlling share, they might become the owner again. And if they're the owner, they're going to have that same commitment problem. So by paying dividends to subsidize participation, because a marginal user gets very little benefit, but he would love to get a dividend, you reinvite these uh, commitment problems. So that's our first extension. Having outsiders participate via speculators may reintroduce the problem. The second is with consensus validators. So proof of work, proof of stake, we're gonna take a general approach to capture the main trade-offs. They have incentive to attack the blockchain again when the profits on the um, platform are low. So it's gonna kind of also reintroduce the commitment problem is that when you have validators, they have a uh, conflict of interest with users, they care about their mining profits, they don't care about users you know, satisfaction or, or surplus, you can have this problem arise again. And that, that's kind of the paper. So those are the key insights. Um, now we're just gonna go through a bit of the math and maybe get a bit deeper into what I'm talking about. There's a literature review here. Um, if I'm missing your name, I apologize. This is just obviously part of a growing literature, um, but we feel like we contribute long several respects. But for the sake of, of brevity, I'm gonna, just gonna leave it if you wanna read the paper. So let's get into the baseline model. There's going to be two periods. It's going to be a static model. That's kind of why I'm going to abstract away from retradability of the token, but I'll talk about what it would do um, after we go through the model. Um, so there, there are three dates. Really, it's only two that matter. There's dates zero, one, and two. At t equals zero, the developer chooses between two funding schemes. Either they can do an equity-based platform, which we consider to be the traditional platform, or a token-based platform. That's the only decision at time zero. What's the equity-based platform look like? The owner holds equity, 
at t equals one and two, it's gonna potentially subsidize users. It can either charge them a fixed cost or it can provide a subsidy. We're gonna let it kind of choose what it wants to do. And it's gonna get revenues from transaction fees. So it can charge a transaction fees to users. It'll get part of that surplus to compensate the owner from setting up the platform. The wrinkle though, is that the owner at the second date, t equals two, can choose to exploit users if the fee is low. And that's gonna in turn undermine user participation at t equals one. And this is where the network effect is really gonna bite. Because even though you're able to exploit and get ex post higher revenue at t equals two, anticipation of this exploitation by users is gonna have more than, uh, more than one for one effects at time one because of the network effects. As some people leave because of exploitation, even more users find it less attractive to be on the platform. So network effects are really gonna bite when it comes to t equals two. On the other side, the owner can say, I don't wanna to have to deal with this commitment problem. I'm just gonna decentralize the platform. And that's what we'll call the token-based scheme. So at time one, the platform is gonna to issue tokens to users, and that's gonna be the exit strategy for the developer. So because there's no central authority that's separate from users, there's not gonna be an issue of exploitation at time two. On the other side though, notice I said that the owner with an equity platform wants to subsidize participation. With tokens, you can't charge a negative token price. You kind of have to charge a positive fee. So you're gonna actually have a cost to joining the platform instead of a subsidy. So users buy tokens to join the platform at t equals one and two. They're gonna transact with each other at those two dates. And again, I'm gonna to try to highlight throughout the differences between these two schemes. So what do users do? Users are only gonna be active at times one and two. At time one, they incur a personal cost kappa to join the platform. Each user has some endowment. That endowment is gonna be e to the AI, where it has some common component A, and then some idiosyncratic component epsilon I, and how epsilon characterizes the dispersion and values across users. This correlated value A is what we'll call the platform fundamental. At t equals one and two, two users are randomly matched. If they're both on the platform, they can transact with each other. If not, there's no surplus, nothing happens. The utility if they do transact is a Cobb Douglas between the good or the endowment of user I and the endowment of user J. And this is following standard international trade models. The optimal solution is you Put, you spend a fraction one minus A to C on your own good, a fraction A to C on your transacting partner's good. Um, so your overall expected utility conditional on matching with a user is one half E to the one minus A to C AI, that's from your side. And then E to the E, uh, e to the A to C AJ in expectation with whoever your partner is. Remember you're randomly matched. So it's an expectation over all possible trading partners where the expectation of course takes into account that there's selection onto the platform. So you're only gonna match with a user whose endowment is gonna be above some cutoff level. So we show it's optimal for users to follow a cutoff strategy and their key decision is gonna be at time one when they decide whether or not to join the platform. So in this setting, the first best equilibrium is kind of, is relatively straightforward to solve. There's gonna be some A star, which is gonna split the parameter space for A. If A is above A star, you get the first best. All users participate. And the way the social planner implements it is it's gonna impose transaction fees on all users and just refund those transaction fees as subsidies to all users to get them to join the platform. This will achieve the first best. And of course, if A is below this A star, the social surplus is negative. We're just gonna shutter the platform. It wasn't a good idea in the first place. So that's the first best. Either everyone is on, or no one is on the platform. And we're gonna see how the equity and the token-based schemes kind of compare to this benchmark. We'll do the equity-based scheme first and then the token-based scheme. So the equity-based scheme, the representative older holds all equity and controls the platform. The way it's gonna levy uh, fees and subsidies is through a two-part tariff system. It's gonna use an entity or a subsidy C at T equals one and the way to think about this is Google provides free email to attract users, Meta provides free messaging. And we're just gonna impose that C has to be greater than or equal to some negative alpha kappa where alpha is between zero and one. We're just not gonna let the equity owner um, fully subsidize the platform. 
Uh, and the way we argue this is, well, if you provide subsidies so everyone joins, you might get some opportunistic users who are just going to take advantage of those subsidies and not actually use the platform, and that's a losing proposition. The other part of the fee is, is a transaction fee delta on the transaction surplus of every transaction. So every time two users meet at time one and two, a fraction delta goes to the owner, one minus delta accrues to the users. The last thing I have to tell you about the equity-based scheme is there's a subversive action, so S element of zero one, zero being no subversion, one being subversion, that allows the owner to exploit user data at t equals two. If the, user, if the owner exploits user data, it gains ga uh, gamma per user at the loss of minus gamma by the user. So that's why we think of it as exploitation. So it can extract value from each user, but this is very costly because the user might have their data leak, they might be getting aggressive advertising, they might be uh, tricked into buying things they don't need through impulse buys. There are many ways to kind of think about this. But essentially, it's a zero-sum game between the user and the owner. And in addition, insult to injury, if the owner takes a subversive action, there's no transaction that equals to just all surplus is destroyed. This isn't essential, it just simplifies things a little bit. So again, the benefit here is the owner can subsidize participation, but it can also subvert at time two um, if it's opportunistically um, advantageous. So how do we solve for the optimal equity-based scheme? Well, the owner at time one is gonna choose a C, which is the subsidy or the entry fee, a Delta transaction fee, subject to not being able to commit at time two not to taking the subversive action if it's advantageous. So this essentially just says at time two, the owner is gonna weigh whether or not it's beneficial to extract user data or to exploit user data given the surplus at time two. And of course, at time one, the owner fully internalizes it lacks this commit it lacks this ability to commit and users participation decision is just based on their surplus so one minus delta is what they get from each transaction ui1 and ui2 are the transaction surpluses at time one and two one minus s depending on whether or not there's subversion minus kappa minus c the entry fee or subsidy and then gamma s if they're if they're exploited so of course, what's gonna be optimal is C is gonna be negative. The owner wants to get as many people on as possible, but of course it can't, cannot, it can't commit not to take the subversive action when A is sufficiently low. And that's just what this equilibrium says. So there's gonna be again, participation, uh, partitioning the parameter space. When A is above some A star E, the owner fully subsidizes participation as much as it can. So C is minus alpha kappa. The owner charges a transaction fee, it's not very intuitive, so I'm not going to show you the expression. And any user above some cutoff is going to join the platform. As I said, it'll be a cutoff strategy. If you get below this A star E, that's when it becomes problematic for the owner. Because between some A star star E and A star E, the platform is still going to be fully subsidized, but now the owner is going to take the subversive action. So at time two, all users are going to incur a cost rather than a benefit from being on the platform. They're still going to follow a cutoff strategy, but we can show that there are actually going to be fewer users joining the platform. And that makes sense. All else equal. Why? Well, if I know I'm going to lose value at time two instead of get value from transacting, it makes it a more daunting proposition to join the platform. What's interesting is because of network effects, this is actually really bad for the owner at time one. So even though at time two, the owner says it's a great idea to subvert the platform to get some more revenue, at time one, the owner internalizes well, a lot of users are going to get off the platform initially when they anticipate this. So because of the network effects, for every user that leaves, another user wants to leave. Because again, it depends on the complementarity of the network effect. User participation, owner profit, and social surplus are all decreasing in the degree of data exploitation. So the more the owner can extract in, in surplus at time two from exploiting users, the worse off the platform is at time one because that subversive action is very damaging to participation. And then finally, if you fall below A star star E, the platform just breaks down. And as you might expect, the worse is the commitment problem, the higher is this gamma, the larger is this region of breakdown. So it's very, uh, it's very problematic on two dimensions. The platform may fail, and even when the platform gets off the ground, less users are on because they, and they anticipate being exploited at time two. The other side is the utility token-based scheme. 
So it's very different in this respect. Instead of holding on to equity and charging a sophisticated fee system, the owner is just going to sell utility tokens at time one and cash out. The owner is going to cede control of the platform to users, and the owner, the users are never going to vote against themselves to exploit themselves at time two. So we get rid of the commitment problem, but now there's no one to provide that initial subsidy, that C that's negative on the utility token platform. So a user is going to buy a token to join the platform and then transacts with another matched user at t equals one and two. It incurs both the participation cost kappa as well as the token price P. Remember the optimal choice of P is negative from the perspective of maximizing the network effect. So because P has to be positive to give developers revenue from cashing out, we have automatically see that utility tokens will impose a tax. They're gonna tax users to get on the platform. So we're gonna assume there's perfect consensus protocols right now, we're gonna abstract from those issues and we're gonna think about those after we consider the utility token based scheme. So the owner now is just maximizing the revenue from selling the tokens, P per token, and then fee uh, negative Z uh, T is just the number of users on the platform. So price times quantity. The marginal user is gonna participate again when their surplus, the left side, is equal to kappa, the participation cost, plus that token price P. That's now the effective cost for joining the platform. As I said, that deters users from joining. Optimally, P is negative but it can't be because that's how the developer cashes out. And the token price here, as we can see, is also determined by the revenue of the marginal user. Whereas with equity, because it's like the average of transaction fees, that's based on the average surplus or the surplus of the average user. The retrain of tokens may introduce additional effects. Again, we're abstracting from that for now. The equilibrium is, is somewhat similar to the equity-based platform. It breaks down below A star star T. So if A is too low, you can find an equilibrium that sets the token price equal to the marginal value of the marginal user and the platform breaks down. But if A is above this cutoff, then we have a unique equilibrium that exists. So let's compare equity versus utility tokens. So given a gamma, given a degree of subversion, if the fundamental is sufficiently high, the equity platform is great. It dominates the token platform. You get higher user participation, the owner profit is higher, social surplus is higher. The equity platform again charges based on the average user rather than the marginal user, so it gets more revenue for the owner. And it also subsidizes the marginal user by having that negative C that subsidizes participa participation. On the other side, uh, sorry, given A, if gamma is sufficiently high, then on the other side, the token platform dominates the equity platform. And this makes sense. When subversion is a really, really big issue, we know that it destroys value. So you get higher user participation, higher owner profit, and higher social surplus. So the token is better for the owner because profits are higher in this situation because it doesn't have to worry about exploitation. So the token platform preempts exploitation by the authority or the owner, but of course, it's inefficient in terms of extracting revenue and of, getting, of maximizing the network effect. So now we were going back to T equals zero. Everything so far has been at T equals one and two. At T equals zero, the owner decides whether or not to choose equity or to choose tokens. And it's gonna be, of course, based on where the prior lies. When the prior is sufficiently high, I'm never gonna subvert, that's great. And I know equity will unlock more value. It'll get more users on the platform. When my prior is low though, then I have to worry about subversion. Then I'm really concerned that I can't help but destroy value at T equals two that's gonna lead a lot of users to exit at T equals one, I'd rather do the token platform. So the prediction here is based on the prior belief, if the prior is sufficiently high, equity platform like Amazon, if our prior is sufficiently low, we're really worried about this technology, then you might go with the token platform specifically to avoid exploitation or the temptation of exploitation at T equals two. We're gonna say this as some empirical support because token platforms tend to have relatively weak fundamentals. So here are several papers that just show that there's a skewed distribution for ICO proceeds. So there are a lot of a lot that fail, and then there are a few that succeed really well ex post after they launch. We kind of see this as being consistent. So now we're going to say, can we have decentralization with subsidization? And don't worry, can I just ask on time just to get some idea? Perfect. 
So can we have decentralization with subsidization? So now that we know the difference between utility token and equity token platform, we might say, well, we can possibly do better because we just chose one revenue scheme. It's not the optimal scheme. It's not the optimal token-based scheme by far. So the question is, can we improve on utility tokens to give tokens a better chance of having a larger parameter space for which they're optimal? So instead, we're going to consider what are called equity tokens. Equity tokens are going to have two flavors to them. They're going to be like utility tokens. You're still going to get the convenience yield from transacting on the platform as before, but now we're also going to introduce a, a dividend as if like equity. So it's going to be a utility token plus some sort of dividend as if you were an equity holder. What we can show is this actually is a, looks a lot like what the planner was doing. The planner had people come on the platform in the first best, and it just subsidized participation by refunding transaction fees. That's what it looks isomorphically like in this situation. So with the equity tokens, with only users, equity tokens are going to achieve the first best. That's even better than equity. It gets everyone on the platform and everyone unlocks the, the maximal surplus for the platform. And we can show the owner retains zero stake and there's a cross subsidization. Light users are going to be subsidized by the transaction fees taken from heavy users and that are paid out as dividends. So this sounds wonderful. There's a harmony between decentralization and subsidization. Assigning cash flow along with control rights improves on utility tokens because owners are never, uh, users are never going to vote against their own interest. They're never going to subvert a time too. And by giving cash flow rights as well, it's a, it's a boost to get everyone onto the platform. That's great. But what happens when you have an outsider? So suppose you have an outsider who can buy equity tokens. They're not going to use the platform. They're not there for any benefit of transacting with other users. They just want to speculate like a hedge fund. They have no incentive to buy utility tokens on their own, again, because they have no use for the platform and they have to pay a participation cost if they were to use the platform. Of course, with retradability, this is kind of where I was saying, you know, speculative motives I'm kind of abstracting from. But suppose now the investor can only can collect dividends but doesn't have to pay the fixed participation costs because it's just going to step back and say, I'm just going to collect the dividend. I'm not going to use the platform. The investor may acquire a majority stake. Again, once you're a 50% owner, you're basically the owner. You can go back to doing that subversion action at time two if you want to. If gamma is sufficiently high, remember, at time two, it's just very, very tempting to just exploit the remaining users. So there are two effects. The first, as I mentioned, is that the investor may acquire a majority stake and subvert the platform. This occurs when A is sufficiently weak, sounds a lot like the owner from before. There's a second, more subtle effect, which is now that the owner internalizes that some of these tokens are being bought by speculators, it doesn't really want to subsidize as much. Why would I want to subsidize a speculator? So you get less of a subsidy as well compared to not only the first best, but also the equity platform potentially. So what this kind of says is assigning cash flow with control rights can revive the commitment problem when you have outsiders participating. Because those outsiders, again, have a conflict of interest. They might exploit the users on the platform just as the owner would. And we can show actually they will do that um, when the platform is weak. And there's kind of a, a pernicious effect as well, like a, a spiral, that if you anticipate subversion that even lowers the token price, to, the equity token price today, makes it easier to get the majority share as the investor as well. That's a bit of a subtlety that we, we show in the paper. So this shows there's actually a tension between decentralization and subsidization. If you try to, if you try to subsidize, you're gonna end up inviting outside speculators onto the platform and that can reintroduce the commitment problem. And this is a key shortcoming to us because the way that pre-coded al governance algorithms currently work is they don't really distinguish between users and investors. This is kind of like an issue with weighting votes by staked holdings. A speculator can have a very large holding, but not use the platform at all. In fact, a lot of the owners of governance coins can be traced back to like private equity and um, private capital firms. Not necessarily saying that's bad at the moment, but just saying that this, this doesn't distinguish between users and investors. So we suggest is this is a very hard problem. It's too hard for us to solve. You know, how do you do the optimal weighting scheme to do voting? But we do suggest maybe transaction fees tell you something, because if someone's willing to waste a lot in gas fees to use the platform, maybe that says they're actually using the platform for its fundamental usage. And maybe they should have a bigger say on the platform. Again, this is not something we can really handle in our paper, but we kind of hint that this might be a way to go. 
So that's one of the extensions. Can you have decentralization with subsidization? The other side is, can we have decentralization with consensus validation? So now we're gonna get back to those proof of work, proof of stake, those consensus protocols we all know and love. So implementation of a consensus protocol creates unique conflicts between users and record keepers. We're by far not the first to recognize this. With proof of work, miners have incentive to strategically attack the so-called 51% attack that Silicon Valley popularized and later became implemented. You have forking the blockchain, which can happen if there's a conflict between miners or between users with on the pool, issues of congestion, and proof of stake also has issues of security, but also richer, get richer dynamics. There are a lot of issues with consensus protocols already, and there's a lot of work on what's the best way to implement them. We're just gonna highlight what we think is an interesting issue, which is that giving cash flow and control rights to record keepers, because they're the ones again, completing all the transactions, may reintroduce the commitment problem in a new form. So I'll sketch basically what we do and just give you the overall insight. Suppose we have some strategic validators that can choose effort and transaction fees. A higher fee, of course, means more revenue per transaction. Higher effort means there's a higher likelihood of winning the block, which is kind of similar to what we see with proof of work. The, the more energy you expend, the higher the likelihood of winning the block. The more, uh, more staked holdings you have as the staker, the, more, um, the higher the likelihood of winning, of, of getting assigned the block as well. We assume a random rogue validator can engage in a 51% attack at T equals two. We're gonna focus on symmetric equilibrium among the other M minus one honest validators. And you're gonna have kind of a mixed strategy a la Burdett and Judd. Why? Because any pure strategy is clearly dominated. If I know you're gonna exert this, if I know you're gonna exert this much effort, then the defenders just exert a little bit more. But if the defenders exert a little bit more, the attacker exerts a little bit more. So you end up with doing a Burdett Judd kind of dispersion over efforts, which is not fun to solve. It took a very long time. But what's going to happen here is we're going to show that the rogue validator is going to attack the platform when again A is sufficiently weak. That's kind of the theme here. When A is weak, you get subversion by the owner. When A is weak, you get subversion by the majority stakeholder. When A is weak, rogue validators have incentive to attack because the transaction fees are pretty low and exploiting a time two can be exposed profitable. And what this is kind of consistent with is attack cryptocurrencies like Feathercoin, Bitcoin, Dole, Zencash, Monocoin, and Verge, they tend to have smaller market caps. They tend to be those smaller coins. As of now, I believe Bitcoin's never had a successful 51% attack, um, just to give some, some credence to this idea. So validation can reintroduce the commitment problem. And we feel like the community kind of recognizes this a bit. If you read Decred's business brief, it argues that significant control of Bitcoin is concentrated among miners and core developers. And in fact, it, it speaks a lot to the issues that we talk about, which is this really also compromises the network effect. What they say is because you have a lot of collusion and issues among miners and core developers, this leads to splitting among the community and splitting the community hurts the network effect uh, in their language and also in ours. So when you have decentralization, consensus validation can reintroduce the commitment problem in a slightly different form than with investors. So just to summarize and give some thoughts, decentralization through tokenization comes with both costs and benefits. And we think that the insight of this paper is that decentralized tokens allow the platform to pre-commit not to exploit user data at the cost of having no owners to subsidize participation to maximize the network effect. Again, you'd love to have an owner like Google or Meta who's willing to provide all these free conveniences to get people onto the platform that maximizes value. But at the same time, those owners have incentive to exploit user data at times when the platform may not be doing so well or it's advantageous. Tokenization can help resolve this conflict, but again, at the cost of this subsidization. And we show there are incentives to re-centralize the platform to reintroduce the commitment problem. So outside investors may buy tokens, and effectively re-centralize the platform by requiring a majority stake. You may also have consensus validators who can attack the blockchain at the user's expense. And because they're the ones completing transactions and choosing how the, the consensus protocols are being implemented, they kind of act like an owner as well. And if they're large and concentrated, you can end up with a similar problem to having an owner under an equity platform. So we think that this is an exciting new avenue to think about how uh, the communities on these crypto platforms kind of operate with each other and how it can unlock value through decentralization. 
And I think that that'll be the end of my time. Thank you.